Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? That mic kind of is uh, obstructive. <laughs> so, um, so tonight we're going to do something a bit different. Uh, and uh, we put together um, an agenda for the next two weeks. Uh, and so over the next two weeks, we're going to cover a book that's called Independence is Overrated, Living in Victorious Surrender by Travis Miller. And it's going to be myself, Vernon Yancey, Jamie Morin, and Carol. Carol registered. So everybody want to raise your hand? So that's Carol over there. Hi, yeah. Carol. Yeah. And did I see Vernon just a moment ago? She's now she's hiding outside. Okay, this is Jamie Morin. So Jay, as you know, Jamie is the leader of our singles group. So thank you, Jamie. And uh, ask Vernon to stick her head in, in when she gets a moment. Um, so this is going to be kind of an ambitious um, overview. And what I mean by ambitious is we've got nine chapters, and uh, we literally will have roughly about 20 minutes for each of us. But the tricky part of the 20 minutes is five minutes is going to be looking at a video every single time. So with every single um, section, right, and these are the sessions, power, promise, purpose, precepts, principles, uh, and people, and this is all around governing our surrender, right, with these principles in mind. Okay, and this book is written by uh, Travis Miller, and uh, I'll introduce you to Travis Miller in just a moment. But uh, uh, when we read this, when the four of us read this book, um, we thought it's just a fantastic book. Um, and we, we haven't asked you to buy the book, but we do recommend that you get the book. My personal uh, opinion on this book is that this is a book that's timeless, so it's not going to expire. You could pick it up next year or five years from now. And um, there would be things I think that uh, I'm speaking for myself uh, that I, I would be enriched to read yet again. So, uh, so it's a fantastic book. Um, Jamie uh, would like to expand the, the discussions uh, in reviewing this book for the singles group to, um, to spend more time on each of these different sections. Uh, because the, the book and the material is really designed to have one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's really about us drawing from one another strengths, right? Because all of us have different perspectives. We all have different experiences. We all have different backgrounds. And each one of those, right, as the body of Christ, um, God wants us to draw strengths and experiences from one another. We're all in different places in the journeys, right? I look all shiny and polished today, but, you know, eight years ago, I was a mess, right? And so all of us have that journey and that path that we've been on and we've grown and, uh, and each of us can benefit. I, I listen to people, you know, I, I've, I've listened to new converts say things to me that God had given them as a revelation and I thought that is revelatory. So there is no doubt we can learn from one another and uh, we want to take these sessions into deeper discussions. But over the next two weeks, we're going to cover the material at kind of a high level, um, and I think it will give you a flavor for the book. But to be frank with you, you have to really read the book to, to actually uh, get the full richness of that, that experience. So with that, if we just go to the next slide, Jamie. So um, this picture looks a little pixelated when I blew it up or when you blow it up, right? But this is the author on the right here, Travis Miller. This is his wife, Rebecca. They have two children, two daughters. You'll see them in the film. They're grown, they're married, uh, but he is a, a, a pastor uh, in a church um, just outside of Seattle. And uh, I, I just have to tell you, after listening to this man uh, in the brief 30 minutes of the six different films we listened to, I personally, there was an endearing uh, part that he just kind of connected to my spirit. So I, I hope you have the same experience. So with that, Jamie, I think what we can do is go ahead and show the first um, video. Thank you. 
standing at Snoqualmie Falls, about 30 miles east of Seattle. And this is one of our most visited tourist attractions. One and a half million people view these falls every year. From top to bottom measures 268 feet. Most of the river is actually diverted into two power plants. The first plant was built in 1899. It operates at the base of the falls, embedded in the rock. It was the world's first completely underground power plant. The second plant is underneath where I'm standing. It was built in 1910. Together, these two power plants have the capacity to power 40,000 homes. The power of the river is converted into 53 megawatts of electricity. Some serious power. But throughout the Bible, there are many instances of people recognizing the Lord God Almighty's power. Job, for instance, responded to his friend Bildad. He got caught up in the Lord's power. He talked about the Lord's creative works. He observed that the earth hangs on nothing. He recognized water, though heavier than air, dwells in the clouds and still remains suspended. Job extolled God, who created the horizon and separated the day from the night. And then Job said this, These are just the beginning of all that he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who can comprehend the thunder of his power? Job awakened to the Lord's power. When they were gathering materials to build the Lord's temple, King David donated 112 tons of gold and nearly 200 tons of silver. After he set an example, the people gave tons of gold, tons of silver, and 675 tons of bronze. And the people started rejoicing over their incredible offering, and King David, he also broke out in praise. In fact, in his exuberance, he grabbed the microphone from the worship leader and said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty. All that is heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You're exalted as head over all. Riches and honors come from you. You reign over all. In your hand is the power and might. In your hand is to make great and strengthen above all. King David confessed the Lord's power and his glory. These two men, Job and David, they recognized the Lord's unequaled power. And they surrendered their lives to that power. In these discoveries, we realize the core of Christianity is to surrender to the Lord's power and authority. When we successfully surrender and recognize the Lord has all wisdom and power, all strength and experience, and all knowledge, we realize He's got all compassion and grace. We realize those things are far and above anything that you or I can conjure on our own. We say this, He has preeminence. And this is where victorious surrender begins, at the Lord's unmatched power. But what about you? Have you surrendered to the Lord's power? Have you done so recently? I'm just wondering.
So we have a large group tonight. So I, before we get started, I would like, or we actually are started, but before I start speaking, I'd like for all of us to stand and we're going to say a quick prayer and ask the Lord, right, to bless the Bible study and uh, bless, bless the fellowship. It's probably more of a fellowship than actually a Bible study. Um, so Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. Lord, we're so thankful for your presence, Lord. We're thankful, God, for your goodness and your mercies, Lord. We pray, God, that your word, God, would speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, we pray that your spirit would impart to us, Father, what you would like to impart to us. Father, we pray tonight, God, that you would have your way. And, Lord, we would grow closer to you. Bless my brothers and sisters. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So um, if you came in just a couple of minutes late, um, I'll just mention that uh, over the next two weeks, we're actually going to be going over a book, right? And it's, it's, it's really um, uh, independence is overrated. And uh, there, there's four of us that's going to be speaking. Sister Yancey was in here a minute ago uh, when I introduced, so she's one. Uh, Jamie and Carol, where'd you go? Right here. Carol, yeah. So the four of us will speak. Um, and we're going to speak for probably about 12 to 15 minutes maximum, okay? Because with each of the three sessions tonight, we'll look at three films like you just saw. And each of them are complementary to the context of the book. So I have three chapters, right? And so I'm going to go really fast because my colleagues, they're, they, tonight they'll have one chapter each. So I kind of <laughs> drew, the, drew the straw for the first three chapters. And so I'm going to go quick. Okay, so a fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. Man is a rebel who must lay down his arms. The process of surrender, this movement full, steam, full speed astern is what Christians call repentance. So we know that repentance is a 180 degree turn. It's we're going the opposite direction. And so what I just read for, uh, to you was a quote by C.S. Lewis. In Matthew 18, 3 and 4, it says this in the New Living Translation, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What a beautiful example of total surrender. I don't have children, but I know there are a lot of parents in here. And you know what it's like when that child is small and helpless and needs everything and relies on you for everything. That is what our Heavenly Father is looking for. That kind of surrender. In the American culture, surrender is counterintuitive. This is not naturally a part of our culture, right? So if you look back to the beginning of the United States, we were born out of a revolution, right? And, and so we said, we don't want to pay taxes on our tea. I mean, so we had a revolution over paying taxes without quote unquote representation. And ultimately, that kind of culture is really the fabric of this country. Um, I had the opportunity, my first time to travel overseas was back in about 1999. And my boss called me into his office and he said, do you, have, do you have your passport? And I said, yes. He said, can you be in Kuala Lumpur next Thursday? I said, yes. And then I had to go look and see where that was because I had absolutely no idea, right? And I got on an airplane and, and flew for 23 hours, okay? My first flight to Asia. And then I was gone for eight weeks. But while there, I was working on a project and I got to meet a lot of people from different cultures. I mean, I was just the American that was kind of you know, my white tennis shoes kind of marked me in the crowd. Everybody knew that's an American, right? Because we have unique ways that we dress, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason I'm bringing this experience up, one of my friends, I developed a friendship there with an Australian. She was a tax attorney that was helping me uh, with my part of the project that we were working on. And long story short, she shared with me one day, she goes, John, you know, Americans are really arrogant. She was not you, but all the rest of them, they're really arrogant. And I always, I was so stunned by that statement. And I just thought, how could that be, right? All cultures look at Americans as though 
they're quote unquote arrogant. And I have to tell you that over time, I have come to the conclusion it has a lot to do with the culture that we're a part of. We're very self-reliant. We believe in independence. We believe we need to be able to stand on our own, right? We need to be able to, 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 to provide for ourselves, to provide for our family. But that's not the kingdom of God, and that's not the way the kingdom of God is designed. He wants us to rely on him, and he wants us to thrive within the context of the body. And all of us in the room are a part of the body. We think of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. However, choosing Jesus as Lord is different than merely acknowledging his saving power. Calling Jesus Lord speaks of surrender. When someone's your Lord, then that is you are saying that they are in command of your life. I will allow him as Lord to direct my life, or I must allow him as Lord to direct my life, to correct me, to instruct me, to test me. As children of God, God is going to grow patience and temper our spirits through trials and testing and developing patience in every one of us. And in order for us to navigate through those times, we have to understand that that's all a part of God's plan because we as individuals, we have this fleshly carnal nature that the Bible says very clearly the carnal nature cannot please God and the carnal nature cannot understand God. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive a treasure in an earthen vessel that is really intended to help us transform. But that transformation can be stifled if we do not fully surrender to Jesus. So I think I've just about covered the first chapter. We surrender to the Lord's promises, his blessings and benefits to the Lord's purpose, his universal and personal plans for us, to the Lord's precepts, which are his instructions, to the Lord's principles, which are his values, and ultimately to the Lord's people, his body. One of the things, and I'll just say this one last thing about the body, I personally am, uh, and I'm, I'm not bragging about this, but I'm a bit of a loner, and that's a bit of a problem. And I can tell you, I don't know how many times I've, I, Service is finished. I say hello to a couple of people and I walk out the door and leave. And I go get my card and the Lord speaks to me and says, go back inside. I need you to go in there. And you need to talk to people. You need to have time with people. I'm not kidding. God tells me this. Go back inside and talk to people. And I will ask him, okay, can I leave now? He's like, okay, you can go home. So, so being a part of the body, right? We are strengthened by having fellowship. We are strengthened by having friendship. How can we possibly say that we love one another as we love ourselves if we don't spend any time with each other, right? Sister Jamie and I were talking last night. She wants to expand this lesson. And I said, listen, we'll have, we'll have people over and we'll feed them. And once we feed them, they'll, they'll be full and they'll start talking, right? We'll get people talking. If we feed them good food, right? Everybody say yes. I know the men will say amen. Right. The ladies will probably be good. Right. Make sure we have something good on the menu, but we'll feed you well and everybody will start talking. So on to chapter chapter two. OK. Surrender's sidekicks is kind of the the um, uh, the part of this lesson. And I got to keep my eye on my watch. So Sister Jamie, can you kind of help me with time? Okay. I'll go fast. All right. Surrender's sidekicks. Right. In, in, in Titus 2 and 11 through 14, it says this, we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Paul said, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives, Titus 1 and 1. Paul recognized that those who turn to Jesus have much to learn in order to live as Christ desires. Growth and progression in our walk with the Lord is completely dependent upon our perspective, permission, patience, and persistence. 
So in the book, you'll see that those four topics are singled out at, as sections in the book as being very important to our walk with God and creating a sense of um, awareness for us to understand that this is part of God's plan. I remember the first time I went through a trial, I almost quoted 1 Peter 4.12 with not, without knowing that that was in the Bible. I told one of my elder brethren, I said, something is wrong with me. Right? And Peter said, he said, look, he said, if you feel like something's wrong with you, you're in a fiery trial and God is doing this to develop you, right? So in our spirit, we start knowing when something's wrong, but the fact of the matter is, is that everything is right. It's just about us ensuring that we have the right perspective. So let me go quickly. So perspective. Um, and I, I, like the, I like the story of Moses, right? So if you look at Moses, Moses, we know the whole story of Moses, right? He was a small child. He was taken by a princess into the palace. He was schooled in the best, edu he had the best education that the world had to offer. And at 40 years old, he decided that he would prefer to be with the Jewish people, right? He decided he was going to be a deliverer. That's how old he was, 40 years old, when he killed an Egyptian. So, well, how could he be a deliverer? Well, the only thing he could do is that he was trained in war also, right? If you look in history in Josephus, you will see that Moses was a general in the Egyptian army. And he expected that he would be able to get the 600,000 men that were slaves working in Egypt, the Jewish people, to actually start a war in Egypt. But that wasn't God's plan. That was not God's plan. And so when he killed that Egyptian to demonstrate to the Israelites that he was faithful and on their side, the complete reverse happened, and he found himself fleeing Egypt, afraid for his life. And 40 years later, God called him when he was old and he was tired. And you read Exodus, right? And you read the story where God spoke to him out of the burning bush, and, God, and he basically said, God, can you find somebody else? But you see, God's timing was perfect, and it was about perspective. God's perspective was different. God needed Moses to become, quote unquote, of the Bible, the meekest man on the face of the earth. And when he was indeed the meekest man on the face of the earth, he was then ready to have a face-to-face -face ongoing relationship with God so that God could tell him some of the most important things that he had to tell mankind but God had to get him in the right place. Moses' perspective is when I'm young and I'm vibrant and we could do war, right? That's what he thought deliverance was about, but God said, no, that's, that's not what I need. I need something different. So you, when God calls you, and I know when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, it's like I, I felt like I was walking about three feet above the ground, but ultimately God called me when I was like 20 years old and it scared me to death to the ministry. He called me. But I never really did ministry and I started doing ministry until a few years ago, right? So I went through, I weathered a lot of stuff. And God spoke to me recently and he said, this is the time. This is when. This is, I have a purpose for you. Now, when you're old and gray. <laughs> okay, persistence, right? When you're going through trials, know indeed that you are no different than anyone else, Right? Your, 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 your enemy, all he has is words and lies. That's, that's his, we his weapons are words and lies. He wants to cause division in the body because the greatest uh, place to have division is in the church. It's among us, right? It's to, it's to make someone feel like someone else thinks differently of them, right? He, it's to peddle, Satan wants to peddle lies to us, right? And so we have to know that. And then we have to be persistent, in our walk with God, knowing that ultimately it is God's purpose for us to go things that are through things that are difficult, very difficult, right? All of us have a story to tell. All of us have a testimony. And we know that ultimately the book of Revelations, that it is our testimony in the blood of the lamb that are the two ingredients to us overcoming. You're watching time. I'm almost out. I'm out. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to skip. I'm just going to say three words, persistence, and I've covered persistence. And so now I'm going to wrap up with chapter three. And I'm just going to say a few words. And this was on the film, right? 
So surrendering is about surrendering to someone who has of greater power and greater authority than you, right? Someone that you trust. Your children, they have no choice but to surrender to you. And when they're young, they're ready. And as they get older, they start kind of stretching their independence, right? And that's when you got to say, did I paddle them enough when they were little? Right. So did 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 the hand of persuasion meet the seat of wisdom, whatever that term is that parents use. Right. So so we have to surrender right to the greater authority. And the book has a lot more in it than than what I'm mentioning. But I'm going to step out of the way. And Jamie, I think you're. You're I'm sorry, Verna, you're up and I'll I'll you want me to put the thumb on. Yeah. Yeah. with surrender to the Lord's power. Some people, they surrender to his power simply by recognizing it. Others surrender to the Lord's power because they need it. Our initial surrender often sounds like this, Lord, can you help me? We face problems or circumstances that we can't resolve, so we seek the Lord's power. We surrender because we need the Surrender that is merely pain motivated often fades. If we live only at this layer, this dimension of surrender, we then are going to experience periodic random victories rather than living in victory. In order to dwell in victory, surrender needs to go farther. It's got to be deeper. disciples surrender to the Lord's promises, his blessings, his benefits. And more than fixing our problems, the Lord has eternal possibilities for our lives. Will we serve him for the sheer potential for the promises he offers? My wife and I, we're blessed with two wonderful daughters. Both are married to fine men, thank God. When both men talked to me prior to proposing, Brad invited me to breakfast. Stephen asked me to lunch. Each, in his own way, spoke of his relationship with this woman he loves, who happened to be my daughter. I remember talk of the future, discussion about what could be. I remember conversation that included faith, excitement, and plans, and promises for their lives ahead. Not long after that breakfast, Brad proposed to Chelsea, and she said, yes. And following a lunch of burgers and fries, Stephen proposed to Haley, and she said, yes. And then there were beautiful weddings. Walking my daughters down the aisle was an amazing experience. The conclusion of that walk, my little girl let go of my arm and took another man's hand. She reached for his hand based on his promises. I blessed the marriage based on his promises. The things hoped for, the things believed in, and yet not yet realized. In Jesus' final earthly instructions after his resurrection from the dead, he pointed to promises. Scripture records in being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Jesus said in, the, in essence this, stay here, don't leave. There's a promise for you. Beyond that, his followers didn't know the specifics. They didn't fully understand what to expect or everything that Jesus implied. Yet, they surrendered to the Lord's possibilities. And they waited. As recorded in Acts chapter 2, the Lord fulfilled his promise. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Promise realized. This past summer, my wife and I celebrated 33 years of marriage. When I talk of weddings and promises, I'm very aware that not enough marriages last until death do its part. Too often, marriage promises aren't realized. But the Lord's promises never fail. In his greeting to Titus, Paul wrote these words. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. I remember my mom singing this little chorus when I was young. Now that I'm older, I appreciate it. She would sing, Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm trusting in his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. Surrendering to the Lord's promises is to change perspectives on serving him. Our Savior is helping us to look forward and surrendering now for promises still to come is the way to victory. So what about you? Have you surrendered to the Lord's promises? Hello, everybody. This <laughs> so my topic will be a discussion on surrendering to God's promises. Surrendering is a core concept of discipleship. If we look in the Bible, all of the disciples, they didn't do their own thing. They followed the teachings of Christ. Same with us. For us to follow Jesus, we have to surrender. As he had mentioned, I want us to go back to when we first needed God, when we first surrendered to God. Usually it's been out of distress, out of a problem we had, out of something we needed deliverance from. And as he said, that usually leads to just temporary victories because once that pain is gone and once he solves that problem, if we don't have something deeper, we start losing our walk with God. So it's important to live in total surrender and victory in the promises of God. Desiring God, not just for what he can do for us day to day, but to live totally surrendered lives so that we can have more of him. The Bible talks about a man of surrender in the Old Testament by the name of Abram. We first introduced to him in Genesis, the 11th chapter, and then bang, chapter 12, God talks to him. And God tells Abram this, I want you to get out of your country, leave your family, and go to a place that I'll show you. Besides Brother John, who will just take a plane right away, I want you to really think, if God spoke to you, I said, I want you to leave your family. Okay, where do you want me to go, Lord? I want you just to be obedient and leave. How many of us would really just do that? It took a lot for Abraham to do that. But in addition to this directive, God gave him six promises. 
also in chapter 12. He told Abraham, I will make a great nation of you. I will bless you and make your name great. Thou will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a promise. But he had to follow that directive. So Abraham did. If we had that great promise and yet that great requirement, I want you to think about which would you focus on? As, he, as John said, we have a tendency to be independent. Human nature. But the thing is this. Our independent thinking can get in the way. And we see that with Abraham and Sarai. But at this point, there's still Abram and Sarai. We see that. Because we have a tendency to focus on the requirements versus the blessing. If we know the story of Abram, he and Sarah are getting old. There is no child in sight. So guess what starts kicking in? That independent thinking. We see Abram's independent thinking first. He is like, well, I don't have a kid. I know God told me I Gonna have a kid, but there's no kid, and Sarah, I don't know, she's not getting any younger. So he starts inquiring about Eleazar. And Eleazar is his servant. And he starts looking at Eleazar, and he's like, huh, maybe that's the one who I'll have the promise through. And God told him, he said, I did not tell you it would be a servant. I told you that your blessing will come from your own loins. In other words, your own child. Example number two, independent thinking. This time we see Sarah. What we see with her is, I'm getting old. And the promise has been a long time ago. No child out of this barren womb. So then, that's what she does. Hagar. Okay, Hagar. That's it, that's it. So we try to help God along. When there's a delay in our promises, this starts working, and we try to help God. Because you know, God, <laughs> let me just help you along. I have the solution. So, he gave his, her maidservant, Hagar, to Abram to have a child. And guess what? A Hagar had a child, name of Ishmael. And how do you think that worked out? It didn't work out well at all. As a matter of fact, we're still paying a price for that. The whole Middle East issue, okay, is because of going outside the will of God. But a child was produced. It was at that point that God went back to Abraham, Abram and said, my covenant again is with you. You will have a child. His name will be Isaac. And a sign of this covenant will be the circumcision of the male. From that point on, we don't see Abr Abram vacillating. And at that point, God changed his name. He said, you will no longer be Abram, but you will be Abraham. And your wife will no longer be Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. When they had that covenant. But there was still a delay of time. So the question is, how did Abraham surrender with further delay? And the answer to that is in Hebrew 11. And we know Hebrew 11, we call that the chapter of faith. 
And that's the answer. Abraham's faith was renewed to the point where he held on to the promise until his seed did come forth, Isaac, his blessing. And in the New Testament, we see also, and the author mentioned this about Jesus, Jesus' promise. He told his disciples, this is after his resurrection, to wait for the promise of the Father. He said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Does anyone see some recurring themes? There are some similarities between Jesus, a New Testament promise giver, and the Father, the Old Testament promise giver. Number one, waiting. Waiting. Both of them, in both instances, people had to wait. Abraham, Sarah had to wait. Jesus told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until. Number two, a combination of directive along with a promise. The directive and Abraham, leave your country, your family, go. I'm going to show you where to go. Then I'm going to bless you. Okay? With the disciples, it was stay in Jerusalem. I don't want you just gallivanting off. Stay in Jerusalem. That was a directive until the promise comes. Same thing with us. So many times, there's a requirement so many times for the promises that we have and that God has given us. And I can speak for myself. <laughs> a lot of times there's a delay. A delay. There are some promises I still have from God that have not come to pass. And this was a chapter that was good for me <laughs> to read and to know about. So that pretty much culminates those two chapters together. But with the promise, if God has given us a promise, let us hold on by faith. Yeah. See the skyline of one of America's great metropolitan cities. You can see the waterfront, pier area, the south of shipping docks capable of loading and unloading the largest container ships on the sea. To the north, the Space Needle is obvious, and within the various high rises that create this skyline are headquarters buildings for some Fortune 500 companies. Starbucks is here in Seattle not far from the shipping docks. Amazon is here, not far from the Space Needle. Also here are Expedia, Nordstrom, and Alaska Airlines. If you go farther east of downtown, Costco's headquarters is here in a little computer-related company called Microsoft. Whether it's online retail, travel websites, or crafted caffeinated drinks, these companies have various purposes. Thousands of workers fulfill their individual purposes while they're employed for the company's purpose. Why do they do that? Well, they want to receive paychecks. They want to leverage benefits. So they surrender their personal purpose to the company's purpose, at least for 50 hours a week.
if you got it street level, there are sidewalks, alleyways, footpaths for the thousands of workers. There are also cardboard mats and sleeping bags of our city's struggling homeless population. The numbers vary. But on the most recent one-night count, there were 3,558 people sleeping unsheltered in downtown Seattle. The reasons for their homelessness are many. Multifaceted solutions are needed, and often there's political and neighborhood tension over this challenge. And compared with the six-digit earning white-collar employees, those living on the streets have a whole different understanding of personal purpose. I'm told by those who minister to the homeless that some of them enter into a survival mode where they struggle to think about a month from now or a year from now. For most of them, their purpose is where's my next meal and where will I sleep? So when it comes to personal purpose, these souls seemingly exist with very little. Now regardless of one's personal purpose, the creator of heaven and earth has purpose for every life. The Creator has an overall purpose for humanity, but also a specific purpose for each individual to fulfill within that larger purpose. The disciples of Christ Jesus know this, and they willingly surrender their lives to His plan. The victorious followers recognize we're not just talented individuals randomly making our way in this world. Instead, we're created beings with divine and eternal purpose. When I consider the skyline and my own personal plans, and they might be exciting, they might be interesting, but there's no way that my personal plans can compare with the Creator's plan. As the Lord told Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. And so just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When we accept this truth, surrendering to the Lord's purpose is just so very simple. It's a surrender that brings me greater victory, and it prepares me for so much more that the Lord has prepared for my life. And so, how about you? Where do you find your primary purpose? Are you most surrendered to your career or to your Savior? Are you most surrendered to your relationships or to Jesus Christ? It's my prayer that you and I both forever will be completely surrendered to the Lord's purpose and discover everything. Right, so our next session here, we're going to be talking about surrender to the Lord's purpose. Now, you would think surrendering is probably the easiest thing we can do in life, but man, when trials start to come our way, <laughs> we tend to try and take control and try to say, okay, God, I think I can do it better. <laughs> but... When we surrender to God's purpose, when we surrender to God's plan, man, it is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. God paints this beautiful canvas of beautiful colors and shapes. Nothing that we would be able to do. Now, there's many of us here tonight that maybe we think, well, I don't really know what my purpose is. Or maybe we tend to think on our past mistakes and we think, well, I'm not going to be good enough to step into God's will for my life. We often think that purpose is just here within these walls and that you have to either be a pastor or in some type of leadership to have purpose in your life. But that's not what it is. And God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us here today. Now, I want to read something to you. This is just a, about a page from the book, and I was going back and forth on whether or not to read it, but I really feel like it just sets the tone for this section because, again, so many of us often think that we're not worthy of what God has for us. And I'll be honest, I'll be very vulnerable. I have seasons in my life, especially when I'm going through transition, that it's like, God, I, I, 
that enemy just tends to get into our heads and tends to make us feel that we're not worthy and that we're not good enough. But I want to read this to you because I just thought that this was absolutely amazing. So I want you to just listen for a moment here. And I know that time is running short and I promise not to keep you long. I know everyone's had a very long day and everyone's ready and probably thinking about being in their pajamas and home in bed. So I'll try and get you there as quick as I can. So suppose you are the human resources director for a significant religious entity and the following resume comes across your desk. Name, Paul the Apostle. Personal purpose statement, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Education, raised as a Pharisee of the purest order. Born a Roman citizen, studied tent making, and graduated from seminary school. His experience, employed by the high priest to persecute and capture Christ followers. Watched as one of those followers, Stephen, was stoned to death. On a road trip, I was blinded by a powerful heavenly light. I heard the Lord's audible voice. Three days later, by Ananias' prayer, my sight returned. Through Ananias' witness, I was baptized and began to follow Jesus. Some three years later, I was finally accepted by Jesus' original disciples. I became apostle to the Gentiles. During my ministry, I spent nearly five years in prison, persecuted by Jews and Romans, stoned once and left for dead, three times beaten with rods, five times received 39 lashes, shipwrecked three times. Accomplishments used by God for the miraculous, cursed a sorcerer with blindness, called lame man to walk, cast an evil spirit out of a lady, completed three extensive missionary journeys, establishing churches in many cities over more than 10 years of work, trained John Mark, Timothy, Silas, Barnabas, and others in ministry, testified to governors, kings, even Caesars, penned a portion of the New Testaments. And here's his summary. I am a serious and successful servant, an accomplished disciple. My prayer is to know Jesus Christ, and I believe that I do. I invite all to follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. What a resume. What a resume. Someone whose mission in life was to persecute the disciples of Jesus. But God, who extended his mercy, mercy, his mercy, his mercy and grace, and Paul, who finally accepted his purpose in life, was to be a follower, and now he's an apostle. There is nothing that God cannot do with each and every one of us here. It does not matter your age. It doesn't matter your season in life. We all think, okay, God, I've, I'm done. I've, I've made transition. We're polished in this season of life, and we're like, okay, it's all done. And God's like, mm, not quite. <laughs> Has anybody experienced that other than me? <laughs> but what a joy it is to surrender to God's purpose. You see, everything that God created was for a reason, which was determined only by him. Purpose is not a concept. It wasn't invented by man, but was already in existence long before his own existence. You see, no man can ever locate his purpose outside of God. So many of us do that. So many of us do that. For purpose starts and ends with him. You see, millions of people today are living according to their own plans and purposes. And that is why there is so much tragedy, disappointments, and frustrations in the world. When we are living outside of God's 
divine will for our lives. We tend to stumble. We tend to allow those feelings of bitterness or overwhelmness or frustration or anger. All those things tend to start to build up inside because instead of going with the way that God has us going, we are resisting what God has for our lives. You see, life begins with purpose. And until you discover what your purpose is, you are merely existing and you are not living. Your destiny is tied to your purpose. So greatness cannot be yours until you locate the task that God has created you to undertake or the problem that he has created for you to solve. God has called each and every one of us. And I know that we, many of us here have grown up in the church and we hear that God's created you for something in particular. He has created us all for something in particular. There are things in my life that I'm not going to be able to do that maybe Brother John's only going to be able to do or Sister Rose is only going to be able to do. God has a divine purpose for each and every one of us. But we have to be willing to say, okay, God, not my will, but your will be done. You see, we often fill our lives with tasks and schedules that leave with no time to discover and to do the one thing that God has created us to do, purpose. We often do say, well, I'll just keep myself busy and that's going to bring purpose. I know there's been many times in my life where I have allowed myself to get so busy, even with the involvement of church, if I'm involved here or if I'm involved there, then that's going to bring purpose to my life. But if we're not focusing and having that relationship with God, no matter what stage we are in life, no matter our age in life, we're never going to feel the purpose that God has for us. And our purpose is ultimately for the kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about being selfish. It's about being selfless. And in order to be selfless, we have to focus on what God has for each and every one of our lives. God's purpose, not my will, but your will be done. You will never have true fulfillment in your life until you have you, your life aligned with God's will in your life. So I'm just going to leave you with this one thing here, this one quote, because again, we often think that we're not good enough. Maybe we don't look the part, we don't act the part, or we don't drive the right car, or we're not connected to the right people. But just remember this, that God is not looking for perfect people. He is looking for surrendered. So I just want to say this to you all, and I'm going to let Brother John close us out. And I'm just so thankful for having each and every one of you here with us tonight. I know that everything was very, very rushed. But I will tell you and encourage you, either get the book or, you know, again, we have relaunched our singles ministry and we are going to be diving deeper into this book. So I just encourage you all either to do one or the other. Of course, I'm going to encourage you to do both and really come to the singles events because it's about connecting and we need each and every one of you. I love you and God bless. Brother John. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so I hope you again. It's kind of quick, right? You can think of it as a as a quick book review. Um, but again, uh, you will you will thoroughly enjoy the book. Next week, we'll talk about precepts, principles, and people, and how all of these fit together as a part of God's model for us surrendering to His will. Right. So. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you next week. Well, frankly, I look forward to seeing you this Sunday. So thank you. God bless you. Is this missed?